Hi everyone, this is Tuplex. Welcome back. Today we're going to be doing something a little bit different. We're going to be taking a look at a base uh, that was sent to me by one of my supporters and patrons, Dr. Von Panda. Let's take a look. Now, um, Dr. Von Panda, the good doctor, has uh, built this base in vanilla, no mods. Uh, which, you know, as much as I like playing with mods from time to time, I do appreciate a good base that's built up in the vanilla game. Um, <clears throat> now, when I, when I initially offered uh, to my Patreon supporters to check out their bases, um, my thinking was, you know, if you're having a problem with your base, you want some advice or help troubleshooting, send me your file and I'll take a look at it and give you my feedback. Well, he sent me this one and I have to say, I haven't really found anything wrong with it. It's, uh, it's actually a very nice, very nice, very clean base. Um, uh, and, and we'll go through it somewhat systematically here. All right. So let's start by, by taking a look at the power. Let me get out of map view. I'm here in a spider, uh, and you can see that <laughs> this is where the game originally started. He left, he left all the wreckage in place, which I think is pretty cool. Uh, so if we take a look at power, uh, we are running completely on solar. So 3.9 gigawatts, 129,000 solar panels, and 109,000 accumulators, which is which seems pretty close to ideal ratio to me. I didn't do the math, but I think it's like. Uh, 48 accumulators to 50 panels or something like that. So um, so that looks really good. And if we look at the layout, um, I mean, obviously the, the base is built into grids. Uh, that's, that's fairly obvious. Um, I think the construction of the grid is, is very nice uh, aesthetically. You know, you've got concrete paths. Um, concrete gives you the the best walking speed in the game um, as opposed to stone. So concrete paths, stone paving inside, and then you've got the hazard concrete on the edges. Looks really nice. Uh, Roboports lining the paths. Now what this results in, if you look at the robot coverage, um, this results in a somewhat checkered portion of robot coverage. So you don't have logistics network coverage on 100% of the base, but then again, you don't necessarily need it everywhere. And in the places where you do want it, um, you know, if you're using bots to move material, uh, then all you have to do is put down a few more roboports, you know, to cover the insides of the grids, let's say. All right, so science is being fed by bots. Um, but in general, there's not a ton of bot activity. Um, let's take a look. Oh, and here's <laughs> something else amusing. Uh, when I jumped in the game, I think this is the first time I've ever been, <laughs> I've ever had a, a guy in Factorio that's loaded with items and yet is not able to craft a single thing. <laughs> I just thought that was interesting. Um, <clears throat> yeah, so let me, uh, let's grab a wire so we can look at robot statistics here. Oh, no, I don't want to see that. I want to see, yeah, bot statistics. All right, so we've got, oh, shoot, what do these numbers mean? Available logistics bots and total logistics bots are X and Y. So uh, 10,000 logistics bots, but only about 500 of them are active. So, so there's actually not, there's not a ton of logistic robot activity in this space so far that I can tell. Um, although he, he does have a ton of bots and he's got 15,000 construction bots. Now, um, one thing I would say that, uh, that might help to optimize things a bit would be, uh, particularly along the walls, would be to segment the robot networks a bit. 
Um, now, fortunately, because of the shape of the base, uh, there shouldn't be any trouble with construction bots traveling over dangerous areas. But, for example, if this was not water, if this was land and there were biters around here, um, you know, if you got damage on a wall here, you could have construction bots traveling across this open area and getting, getting destroyed by biters. Um, but in this case, everything, the entire base is connected <clears throat> in a single robot network. Here you can see, you can see some of the bots moving out here. I'm not sure exactly where they're going. Maybe they're going to do repairs or something, but, uh, in any case, uh, it, it could be a little bit more efficient, um, for the bots to segment the networks a little bit. Um, you know, have maybe, you know, segment each side, um, by a few into a few separate robot networks and then have supply stations. You know, that would be one thing that, that I might consider just to, um, just to make sure that you have bots and repair packs, uh, closer to the wall where they're going to be needed. But, but even then, as it's set up right now, the, uh, the double row of turrets here doesn't seem to be having any problem at all keeping up with the biter attacks. Okay. Um, now if we look at the turrets, um, not much artillery. There is, I saw somewhere there was a, a set of artillery wagons. <clears throat> I'm not sure if I'll be able to find it again though. I can see the outline. It's somewhere around here. Ah, here we go. Yeah, so he's got some artillery wagons set up here. Um, you know, and you can use those for you can use those for manual targeting. Uh, I don't know if he's got the target remote anywhere. And I sure as heck can't craft one. Ah, here we go. Right, so that way you can, you know, you can hit various spider nests that are within range of, of the turrets, but, uh, but the outside is pretty clear and, um, there doesn't seem to be any issue at all defending this base. Um, all the water helps quite a bit too, you know, like almost this entire side is, is bounded by water, uh, which means you don't need to set up defenses there. So very nice job there. Um, so the defenses are simple and very effective. Like I said, I like the, uh, I really like the grid structure, you know, lots of lights, the robo ports, the concrete is just very, very clean and, um, and well organized in my opinion. Um, now the solar, the solar design, uh, is not, is not the most compact. Okay, but each one of these little, each one of these little squares has a 20 to 17 ratio, which again, I haven't done the math, but I know it's pretty close to the ideal ratio. Um, but, you know, ideal really depends. Um, you can always, you can go with more solar than the ideal ratio calls for if you want your accumulators to recharge more quickly. Or you can go heavy on the batteries, uh, especially if you know if you're on a death world or something where your laser turrets are are very active. Uh, you probably want to go heavy on the batteries to handle uh, bursts in energy consumption. But uh, but this looks really good. Uh, now what is this? Okay. Oh, okay. This is the day-night cycle. So these green peaks are when the accumulators are recharging at night. Or during the day, rather. Sorry about that. Okay. But the power looks good. And uh, like I said, this is not the most dense uh, design in the world, but it's, uh, it's, very, it's very simple. Right? You just make this cross with accumulators and surround it with uh, 16 solar panels and then start tiling them down. They fit neatly within the within the structure of the grids, 
And uh, especially in a vanilla game, one thing that's, I think, pretty nice is that you can actually navigate through it on foot, um, which the most, the most compact designs do not allow you to do um, because everything is, you know, all the solar panels and everything are all touching each other. So having the space in between, I think, is, is pretty good. And if you're going solar for your base, you're going to be taking up tons of space anyway. So if it's a little bit less dense than it could be, it's, you know, it's not really, it's not really a game changer at all. Um, radar coverage is obviously very good. Perhaps, perhaps a little excessive on the radars. Um, let's see how much power we're consuming. Yeah. <laughs> so radar is the number five power consumer, 267 megawatts. You know, it's okay. <laughs> Could probably get by with fewer radars. Um, but once you get this big and you're just automatically stamping down these these cells with bots, then I think you don't really want to be bothered with having to, uh, you know, individually place every single radar. Just, just include it in your grid blueprint, and if you stamp down too many of them, then oh well. Okay, so... Like I said, uh, nice layout, nice power structure. Uh, bot coverage, bot coverage is total. You know, it's across the entire map. So anywhere you go, bots can assist you either with logistics or with construction. Um, and you have complete visibility of the entire base. So that's very nice. Now, uh, this base is currently is putting out about 250 a minute on science. Okay, pretty consistently uh, doing doing mining productivity, which is what I like to do at in the end game. Um, and I've been letting this run for a little while. I haven't seen any any significant any significant bottlenecks. Um, but one thing uh, one thing that kind of stood out to me at the beginning was that this base looks very much like one that was. Um, this, or what I want to say is this doesn't look like, uh, the kind of factory that where you built a starter base to get your research done and then started building the mega base as a separate base. This looks, this looks like a base that evolved from the very beginning. You know, again, the crash site is right here and here's, and here's 250 science a minute. Uh, with modules and beacons and everything else. So so it appears, at least uh, from what I see right now, it appears that he started with this grid structure in mind from the very beginning and just built it up. Uh, he probably rebuilt each of these sections as he got modules and beacons uh, opened up and available. Um, and so it's still still using the main bus probably that he started building from you know the first hour of the game which i think is is pretty cool so you don't necessarily have to have a starter base and then the mega base you can you know you can grow your your starter base into a mega base if you want to take the time to do that and if you plan from the beginning to make sure that you leave yourself room you know because obviously a, a fully beaconed smelting setup um, you know, can take up a lot more space than, than an early game, uh, type of a setup. But, um, you know, here we have, uh, science pack production. We've got red, green, and military science here. Uh, blue science over here. Doing a lot of the component fabrication, uh, in the same area. Um... And all that, all that looks really good. Uh, what, what do we got going on here? Wood. This is wood storage. Oh, <laughs> look at the burner inserters. <laughs> right. So this is how excess wood is dealt with. It just goes around in a circle. <laughs> It goes around in a circle until the burner inserters use it all up. That's pretty clever. <laughs> nice, radi 
nice way to get rid of the wood that you pick up. I actually want to see that in action. I wonder if I can pick up some trees somewhere. Uh, no, I think he did that already. <laughs> can I reach that? No. Oh, bummer. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Yeah, looks like he already had fun with all the wood. So, but anyway, that's a uh, that's a clever idea. Okay, over here we have the mall um, running modules on the gears, which uh, I think is a good idea. Uh, we've got buffer chests to reuse uh, components as they get upgraded. Huge storage area here. Um, and, uh, you know, over here there's more room to expand. Um, I thought this was interesting, and this is something that uh, I hadn't thought of doing before, but I probably will at some point. You know, typically you just run some belts of gears down the center of the mall, like he has over here. This is what I would call a, you know, a classical mall setup, um, you know, which was invented by. Well, I forget who invented it. I want to say probably Manzuri or somebody invented it. I know Catherine of Sky made it popular and, and everybody else started using it as well. Um, but over here, he's got a belt of gears and pipes. Which uh, I thought was pretty interesting because, you know, there are a lot of components that use that use gears and pipes to get built. Um, yeah, so why not do that too. Now, not all these things use pipes, but uh, I thought that was a good idea. You know, and then you can you can put things on either side depending on what you think is, is necessary. Here's the solar build. Uh, over here we're making batteries. Right, and then down this way we've got the rocket. Uh, which is <laughs> which is heavily outfitted with beacons, um, and as you can see, the production is almost instantaneous once the components get loaded. So um, you don't need all those beacons. You could certainly save on power without them, but then it wouldn't look so nicely symmetrical. Right, and fast inserters. Uh, over here, the space science packs go into active providers, so they get put into storage if not brought to the labs. And you've got your three components being fed in. Uh, right now, the bottleneck are low density structures. Let's go see how low density structures are doing. Like I said, I was I was kind of looking for issues that I could comment on, but I haven't really. I haven't really found any problems, to be honest. Okay, looks good. All right, so this is the main part of the factory. Um, let's take a look at the red circuits. I thought this was a pretty, or the, the circuit builds I thought were really well done. So here we're making blue circuits and the only inputs are iron, Iron, copper, red circuits, and acid. So almost all of them. <laughs> the only the only inputs are almost all the inputs. Um, but uh, I thought this was a nice idea uh, because blue circuits require so many green circuits, right? Twenty each. Um, he decided to build the green circuits right next door and insert directly, which I thought was. An interesting idea um, and it's very well laid out and it seems to be working pretty well yeah I mean the that single machine is keeping up with the green circuits with all the modules and everything um, again a little nitpick here you might you know you might consider using stack inserters instead of blue inserters um, 133 kilowatts. Yeah, you you could maybe save on some power. 
Um, inserters only consume electricity when they're moving. Well, they consume max consumption when they're moving. Otherwise, they consume the minimum amount. Okay, so three fast inserters will use about 150 kilowatts. And a single stack inserter will use 133. It's a little bit less. So, I mean, it's not, it's not a big deal. But, uh, again, if you're really looking for optimization, those are the types of things I would look at. <clears throat> and then you'll have more power available for other stuff. But, but I do like this. I do like this design. Um, I like how it's in rows with beacons on either side. Uh, you know, symmetrical from left to right. Uh, it's really nice. Um, and having, having a row of buildings with rows of beacons on either side, I think is a very convenient way to build. Um, I know in a lot of the builds that I've done for large bases, I get very much, um, obsessed with with trying to maximize, optimize my module use by surrounding every machine with 12 beacons, you know, like he's doing here. Um, and yeah, this, this way you get the most output per the number of modules that you use. But um, I don't know, a after a while, I think it just makes the base kind of look boring if it's just, the whole thing is just tiled with all these little self-contained units, you know what I mean? So I, I kind of like, I kind of like having this sort of setup because then you can still, you can still exercise some creativity in your builds and, and how you lay out the buildings and transfer materials between them and so forth. Whereas, um, with this type of layout, I think your, your design options are much more limited and it's, it becomes a little bit boring after a while, to be honest. Okay, um, let's go take a look at red circuits, and then we'll take a look at trains. He wanted me to uh, he wanted me to focus on trains and let him know what what I thought of that. Okay, so the uh, so red circuits are coming in by train. Let me get uh, let me get Spider Tron over here. I think this is the one that I want. Yeah, here it comes. And then he's got a group of spider trons uh, on this other remote. I'm assuming that he uses those for combat. And this one for travel. Okay, so let's see where red chips are made. They are being made over there. So let's head over and take a look at that area. Alright, so that's one of the one of the few components that are being made outside of the base, right? He's got concrete being built over here. That's rather interesting as well. Hmm. Yeah, we should take a look at that. But let's look at the red circuit build first. Um, Yeah, so here again, um, doing not really, not direct insertion in this case, but, um, you know, building components uh, right next to the building that consumes them. So uh, bringing in copper, bringing in iron, plastic. Um, plastic is out at the moment, so it seems like plastic is perhaps the bottleneck in this factory right now because um, I think that's what was that could have been what was holding up the low density structure production as well but in any case um, making a lot of uh, copper wire make the green circuits and then that feeds into the uh, red circuit production buildings uh, which are then going on to a shared belt with the plastic. Uh, and then the plastic gets blocked off here and the red circuits come down the pipe. Here, we can see it working over here. Uh, 
Yeah. So, I mean, I like that. It's a real nice, clean build. The belts are very well organized. Um, you know, the, just the fact that you can, that we can walk around through this space and easily see what is going on, I think speaks a lot towards the, or speaks a lot to the, um, to the logical layout and construction of the base. So I, I really have nothing but good things to say about this. Now, uh, if we look at the train system, uh, first of all, let's just look at the layout. Um, it's not, it's not a grid. Okay. Um, one thing that we can observe is that, uh, the train lines all travel through the centers of the grids, which makes for good organization. Um, and then wherever it travels through a solar grid, uh, you just remove some of the some of the solar arrays. Um, yeah, oh, that's too bad. <laughs> that's too bad. Um, but yeah, so it looks so it looks real good. It's really well laid out, uh, I would say. Uh, we've got stackers feeding into the stations. Um, probably the most interesting thing to note. <clears throat> is that for every commodity that's being moved by train, there are source stations and sink stations, which I think is just another way to say a station that's consuming the item, right? Sources and consumers. Um, and so he doesn't try to, he doesn't try to program train routes for every single pair of stations. He just has each one going to the source until it's full and then go to the sink until it's empty. And then the sinks are only turned on when they need to receive something. Um, I forgot where I left my spider. Okay, let me call it again. There it is. I don't want to run around and get run over by a train. so. Okay, so this is a copper plate sink. So this is one of the receivers. Uh, train limit is set to one, so it'll only send one train at a time. And the station is enabled when there are less than 40,000 copper plates in the chests. So right now, this, this station right now, or both of these stations rather, are disabled. Okay, that's the copper plate sink. So here's a copper ore source. Here's a copper plate source. Same deal here. Uh, there's well here he's not he's not bringing the ore directly. Um, so he's so he's doing the smelting next to the resource patches and then shipping out the plates, which results in less train traffic. So I do like that as well. Um, I don't know if that's the case everywhere. Here we've got raw stone. Oh, okay. Yeah, here's a copper ore sink. So the original the original smelting lines that feed into the main base are receiving ore and doing the smelting there. But um, over here in the red circuit area, we're just bringing in plates rather than ore. So... Um, so I do like the train system. Uh, we can see here all the trains, you know, they've all got the same schedule. And all they do is they go from source to sink, source to sink, sink to source. Um, and then you just add more trains as you need them. And all the stations are set up in the same way. So even the train system itself is, uh, is real neat, clean, simple. Um, even just, even just controlling when the stations get turned on, it's just one red wire. And if we get below a certain amount, we open it up so another train can come in. So, um, so I like it. I mean, it's just, it, it's, uh, I don't want to say it's a minimalist design, but it's, you know, there's that quote attributed to Einstein or whoever, um, that says that, Perfection is not when you can't add any more, it's when you can't take any more away from it. And I think that's kind of close to what we're at here with this train system. It's really, 
it's really clean and simple and it works as we can see on our production graphs okay we look at an hour and science pack production is a solid 250 a minute the whole time let's look at 10 hours yeah okay 10 hours is a little bit lower there's been a few blips here but he may have still been expanding the base at that point so <clears throat> I figure if you can go an hour with uh, solid production nonstop then you're doing pretty well I don't I don't think these turrets are even taking any damage I'm not sure what level of uh, well we're probably maxed out on the on the turret stuff yeah pretty much okay um, yeah so and the actual layout of the trains um, you know you've got two parallel rails on either side of the main portion of the base um, and then after that it essentially just goes where it needs to go um, lubricant sources over here I didn't look at refining here's oil yeah where's the oil coming from where's the oil source oh here it is okay yeah lots of speed modules which is good that way you can keep your oil production up as the as the resource starts to deplete and it'll go down to a minimum level and then it's essentially infinite so you just load it up with speed modules to keep the rate up um, okay and then here's the oil sink okay here's the refining lots of solid fuel into rocket fuel So this one, it appears, is purely dedicated to making lubricant and rocket fuel. Um, this looks like a balancer on the tanks. Although I would like to take a look at what those combinator settings are. So let's start making our way over there. I think it'll take a while to get there. Uh, but we'll see if we can take a look at that before I finish looking at everything else. Okay, now one thing I did check is whether the grids were chunk aligned, and they're not. So, <laughs> so I would, I would say that. So I would put this base in the A tier, but this just kind of keeps you just out of the S class. Um, <laughs> as far as bases go right now um <clears throat> the other thing i wanted to comment on is that the the production here <clears throat> you know 250 science packs a minute is is not huge right it, it wouldn't qualify as a quote unquote mega base which people generally consider to be a thousand or more per minute um but who cares? Who cares? It's a, uh, it's a really well built, well organized base. It runs nearly flawlessly, and it's big. You can tell that a lot of time and attention was taken to build it. And I'll be honest with you, the big numbers to me are not is not really what impresses me anymore. You know, I mean, I've built, um, you know, and this is just me talking. I, I mean, other people have built bases much bigger than I have. Uh, the biggest one I've done is 2,500 science a minute. And uh, it was kind of a chore. It was kind of a chore to build that base. And, and I wouldn't say that I got any more enjoyment out of it than I would have by building something that's a little bit smaller, more compact. I think, I think just executing a well thought out design, building it cleanly and simply like this, uh, 
to me, that's what it's all about. And if it's 250 or 500 or, or 10,000 a minute, doesn't really matter quite as much. You know, if he wanted to make, if he wanted to get the numbers up, I think, I think he could expand this base in a similar style of, of, or a similar design concept and easily get there. It's just a matter of taking the time to build it. Right. He probably would have to abandon the bus based build for, you know, for his production components, let's say, you know, keep this for the mall um, and then start doing more outposts like this to get the numbers up. But, um, but I wouldn't, I wouldn't feel compelled to do that. You know, I think this is, this is great as it is. Um, and I think this, this is a, a piece of work to be proud of. All right, let's see. Did we, where did my spider go? Is it still coming here? <laughs> All right. Where am I? <laughs> okay. Here I am. Uh, oh, okay. I think I set this, I think I sent the spider to where I wanted to go. <laughs> yeah, there it is. <laughs> well, that was dumb. Anyway, I'm just going to assume that these combinators are there to uh, <laughs> to balance the load. Although this storage tank is empty. Oh, but that's okay. So it comes in here, and then it gets distributed to both sides until they're all approximately the same the same fill level. Okay, so I think that's about all I have to say about it. So, Doctor Van Doctor Von Panda, thanks for. Thanks for sending me your file to look at. Um, I think there's a lot of a lot of good stuff here that uh, that other players can learn from. Uh, it's I certainly find it inspiring, and I might even adopt some of your ideas in my next base. And uh, I think this is a, a very well done base. Congratulations! So, if any of you have uh, thoughts or suggestions for Doctor Von Panda, leave those in the comments. Thanks for watching. We'll see you all soon.